class, this is our lab test one review, and we will be taking this test on Thursday at our regular lab time, which is 835. Now, when you arrive on Thursday, make sure and be prompt and bring a calculator and a pencil, and the calculator needs to be able to do multiplication. That's all. It's a simple calculator. You can use a more complicated calculator, but don't go and buy one. Just a simple calculator will be fine. But whatever you have, you need to bring it because you will not be allowed to use your cell phones on the lab, uh, lab test. Okay, so exercise one was the scientific method. And guys, you do need to outline the steps in the scientific method. Now, the day we did the scientific method formally is the day that the earthworms all died. It's kind of a sad day. But... Um, I think you have a handout on that. Why don't you look in your notes and see if you have the handout on the scientific method. I think I handed it out to you. And it was the day we observed and measured earthworms. And then I think we conducted an experiment back on um, Raul and Sean's table on how earthworms respond to light and how earthworms respond to moisture. Did you guys find that one? At the very bottom of the first page of that are the steps of the scientific method. And so I have that the steps of the scientific method are observations, then creating a hypothesis based on your observations. And don't forget, a well-written hypothesis has the if, then, because sentence structure. And then there's an experiment, and in the experiment, there's always a control. You have to know the two reasons why controls are important in experiments. What are the two reasons why controls are important in experiments? Validation. Comparison. Good job. Validation and comparison. That's good. And then you have to be able to reach a conclusion. Now, basically, conclusions only fall into two categories. The data support the hypothesis or the data do not support the hypothesis. It's basically the two conclusions that we come to at the end of an experiment. Either the data did support the hypothesis or it did not. Okay, so if I were you, I would review especially the questions at the end of that activity. And I recall numbers 8, 9, and 10, we actually read sentences and had to predict if the sentences were a hypothesis, an observation, or a conclusion. So make sure and reread that activity. I have, if given an experimental variable, be able to determine the experimental group. Hold on. If given an experimental variable, just mean a, I guess I just mean an experiment. Be able to determine the experimental group, control group, experimental variable, and the data. So you remember one day in class I asked you to work with somebody to design an experiment to see if diet affected the color of shrimp. Do you remember that? And at the end we did some clicker questions on what was the experimental variable, and you guys said it was the diet that we gave the shrimp. And the control group was the group of shrimp that ate the regular shrimp food called shrimp chow. And they were the control group because we knew what color they were going to become at the end of the experiment. Remember, the control group, you can always spot it, is the group that you know what's going to happen. And because you know what's going to happen, they're the group that validates the experiment. Um, the experimental uh, variable, again, was diet in that activity. And then the data that we collected would be things like the color of the shrimp, or the mortality of the shrimp. What does that mean, mortality? If they die or not, the death rate of the shrimp. Correct. Now, the other, I just think everybody can remember this. We had four tanks that we were going to hypothetically put these shrimp into. One tank was our control group. Do you remember what the other three tanks were? Those are the experimental groups. And we had one tank for green algae, 
one tank for brown algae, one tank for red algae. So our experimental groups were the groups where we didn't know what was going to happen, whereas our control group was the group we did know what was going to happen. Okay, and in a control and an experiment, you always should know the outcome. If you don't get what you expected, there's something wrong with your experiment because your control has not been validated. Okay, so look at the words I have up there. Make sure, like thinking of the shrimp experiment, that you would be able to pick out what were the experimental groups, what were the control group, what was the experimental variable, and what was the data collected. Are you okay on the terms up here? Super. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, be able to form a hypothesis or write a hypothesis. Or, since this is a multiple choice test, let's just be honest, you're not going to have to write a hypothesis. It's a multiple choice test. You have to pick a hypothesis from a list of statements. And so that's why I was telling you, if you read numbers 8, 9, and 10 on your handout, we practice that. But a good hypothesis always has the if, then, because sentence structure. Um, a conclusion is easy to spot also. The conclusion usually has the, the sentence structure of the data support or the data do not support. You can always spot a conclusion because it'll say something like the data support or the data do not support. So it's pretty easy to spot a conclusion. Yes, sir. Okay, scientific method so important. We're going to keep that going all semester, and you'll even see questions on the scientific method on your final exam. Okay, I'm going to move to exercise two on metric measurement. <clears throat> and I have know the meanings of the metric prefixes is number one. Well, I went ahead and wrote this down, guys, up here on the screen. Let's see if you can fill in these blanks for me. Everybody practice it on your piece of paper first. I have how many centimeters are in a meter, how many millimeters are in a centimeter, and how many millimeters are in a meter. Okay, so class, what'd you come up with on how many centimeters there are in a meter? Make up your mind, 10 or 100. How many millimeters in a centimeter? 10. And how many millimeters in a meter? That's good. Are you okay on that one? Okay, here's what I think Alyssa was just uh, asking about. And if you don't remember this, you may have written this on page 21 in your lab manual. It's a possibility. Cheyenne, is that correct? Yeah. Cheyenne said, look at page 21. We went over it in class the day we were on page 21. So you may have written this on page 21. So one day we were looking at the ruler under the microscope, and we all came to the conclusion that millimeters are simply too big to use as a um, source of metric measurement for the microscope. It's just too big. So you may recall they took the millimeter and they divided it up into micrometers. That fancy U is the symbol for micro, the Greek symbol for micro. And so how many micrometers are in one millimeter? A thousand. Good, you did find it. And then with the invention of the electron microscope, micrometers actually were just too big to be very useful. 
So they divided a micrometer up into nanometers. How many nanometers are in a micrometer? A thousand again. So we figured out as a class how many nanometers must be in one, that's supposed to be a millimeter. Hold on. Micro? It's a fancy U? Yeah, it's a fancy U. Fancy U, fancy M? Got them both. I'm just fancy. Miss Tiny's just fancy. It's true. Okay, so how many nanometers are in a millimeter? A million. It would be a billion in a meter. That's good. Apparently, Sean knows some math, how to move that decibel. Yeah, you're good at math. I'm glad to know that. Okay, now, class, I want you to uh, take a moment to open your drawer and find the small ruler that we usually keep in your vicinity. It's plastic. It's either white plastic or clear plastic. And I want you to get it out and put it where you and your lab partner can both see it. Anita, everybody find a ruler. Is that a yes? yes? So I want you to look at this ruler that's in front of you. Everybody look at the ruler in front of you, and I want to know how many centimeters are on this ruler. How many centimeters are on this white or clear plastic ruler? How many? Fifteen? Everybody agree on 15 centimeters, Colby? 15 centimeters? Jordan? 15 centimeters? Okay. Now, looking at that same ruler, I want to know how many millimeters are on that same ruler. 150. 150. So, everybody, okay, I'm looking at a ruler. And tell me how many centimeters and how many millimeters are on a ruler. Yes? Okay, great. All right, we're going to go to number two now, number two, and I have number two as um, conversions. We have to convert now, and I have 23 centimeters is how many millimeters? What would be the answer? Would it count that one? Okay, we've got to convert 368 millimeters to micrometers. Ready? Okay, so far? How about this last one? Let us convert six micrometers into nanometers. Hey, the, some of you really had that down. How did you know which way to move the decimal and how many? Did you use this information to know which way to move the decimal and how many times? It's this chart that we use to do this. This is previous chart we just did. That's how we knew to do this. Or that chart right there. So are you going to have to know these conversions? Indeed. That also means yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh, we did the ruler already. You said that that ruler was 15 centimeters, 150 millimeters. Everybody's okay on that one. No, I'll give you a different ruler. Yeah, so apply your knowledge in a new situation. It's kind of what college is trying to teach you to do, to apply your, have knowledge. I don't know if you know why do you go to school. I don't know if you know that. People ask me all the time, what do I ever need this for? To have knowledge and apply it in a new situation. Yes. Very good. 
Okay, I need the freezing and boiling points of water. Now, guys, we are in a science class, so what scale should you use? Celsius. So what's the freezing point of water in Celsius? Boiling point of water in Celsius. Laura? Okay, on this test, you also have to show me skills. You know, show me that you can do stuff. And so one of the things you're going to have to do is weigh an object using the triple beam balance. And I want to remind you on the triple beam balance, really the only thing you can mess up is not putting the weights in the notches. On the back two rails, of the triple beam balance, there were notches, and the weights have to fall in the notches for you to be reading the correct weight. If you're not putting the weights in the notches, then your measurement's not accurate. No problem on weight. Okay, length, no problem on length. I know you guys can read a ruler. Just make sure you're using the metric side, the metric side. Volume, we did volume in two ways. So I want to hold this up. In the air. This is a blue box. A blue box. I think you can do volume of this box using what tool? A ruler. How? Length times width times height. Bring a calculator. You cannot use a graduated cylinder to do the volume of this blue box. Which, yeah, if it was well graduated, a beaker with nice graduations, that's for sure you could. Okay, so length times width times height. He's okay on that. And we're going to bring a calculator because we're not allowed to use our cell phone. Okay, so check this one out. Now I'm holding up a pair of forceps. How would you do the volume of this pair of forceps? Graduated cylinder. Now, would you have to know how much water is in a graduated cylinder before you put in the forceps? Yes. Okay. It cracks me up. I see you people put the forceps in the graduated cylinder and there's no water in it. Okay. Then you pour water on top of it. It just cracks me up. I laugh all the time. It just make me smile. You all make me smile. Yes. So you have to know how much is in the graduated cylinder. Make sure you put enough in there so that the forceps will completely go under the water. And then you put in the forceps, and then what do you do? <laughs> measure the change. Measure the, measure the difference. And so we call that volume by displacement. Okay, so just to recap on volume, you're going to have to do it in two different ways. Length times width times height. Make sure you use centimeters. And volume by displacement using the graduated cylinder. Okay, so number five is going to be showing your skills, your lab skills. Okay. Say it louder, Jonathan. When you're measuring volume on um, to do length times width times height, to do centimeters. Do you guys remember why I prefer centimeters when you do length times width times height? So if you do centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, you get centimeters cubed, and one cubic centimeter is equivalent to one milliliter, so we can move back and forth easily between our comparisons. So that's why we tend to use centimeters. Centimeters are used extensively in uh, health care. You guys have heard them say, give this patient three cc's of adrenaline. Cc means cubic centimeter. So it's used in, in medicine also. Okay, so centimeters for Length times width times height. Okay, number six is what is a meniscus? And maybe you can tell with my excellent drawing that I drew a graduated cylinder up here with a pink liquid inside of it. So what is a meniscus? Okay, it's how the water goes, dips down in the middle. And we studied why that happens. We studied that happens because water is adhesive to the glass of the graduated cylinder. So how do you properly read the meniscus? Look at the bottom. At the bottom. Now, guys, make sure that this graduated cylinder is on the tabletop. Don't pick it up because 
here's, I'm just making this up. Let's say I had 33 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder. 32 is an answer. 32.5 is an answer. 33 is an answer. 33.5 is an answer. 34 is an answer. Okay. I'm not playing around. You need to be able to read a graduated cylinder. So make sure you keep it on the tabletop. And then what do you do? You got to get eye level. Eye level. So keep it on the tabletop. If you pick it up, you're not going to have it level. And you may misread it. Well, accuracy is important in science. Okay, on the graduated cylinder. Okay, exercise two microscopy. I want you to dash in your lab manual to page 14, please. And I just want to remind you that we have different kinds of microscopes that show different things. Basically, in biology, we have microscopes that use light as a source of energy and microscopes that use electrons as a source of energy. Here on our campus, we have those that use light. But we've talked about and looked at pictures from electron microscopes also. Mm, 50-plus. I think that would be one of the lower-end ones, 50,000. And that would be, you know, how everything comes high end, low end. Oh, $50,000? Mm -hmm. Not $50. Just that microscope, the compound light microscope in there is $1,400 just for that. So, yeah. You know, uh, it's supply and demand. There's not much demand. It's kind of like farm equipment. Not many people buy a tractor, okay? So they're going to have to make some money on those tractors. Okay, so the first thing is what microscope would be used to view? And so I want to ask you a few things. Like, what if you wanted to see blood cells under the microscope? What kind of microscope would you use? I'll give you some choices. You could use a compound light microscope like the one in the cabinet. We could use a stereoscope. That's another one we have here in the room. Or we could use an electron microscope. What if you wanted to see blood cells? What would you use? You could use the compound light microscope. Would they look good on an electron microscope? Sure they would. You'd get some great details of blood cells if you used an electron microscope. And page 14 actually shows that. Letter A is from the compound light microscope. That's blood. And B is from the transmission electron microscope. C is from the scanning electron microscope. Um, what if I wanted to see the surface of a fly? I caught a fly, I killed the fly, you know, with a little alcohol you can kill a fly, and then I wanted to look at it under the microscope. Sean? Stereoscope. Stereoscope, Stereoscope would be excellent for looking at the details of a fly that you may have count, uh, caught. Or um, maybe a beautiful flower that you had seen and you picked and you wanted to look at it in more detail. A stereoscope would be very good for that. I want to remind you that compound light microscopes show internal details. Stereoscopes show external details. So if you want to see internal details, you're going to use the compound light microscope. If you want to see external details, you're going to use the stereoscope. Those are the two scopes we have in lab. What is the other one, stereoscope, and what else? Compound light microscope. Mm -hmm. So here at San Jacinto College, we don't have electron microscopes, but I just want to point out how they're different, and the main thing that makes them different is their source of energy. Compound light microscopes use light as a source of energy, and electron microscopes use electrons as a source of energy. Which one can get you higher in magnification? Electrons. Do you remember why? Yeah. So it's the problem with light. Everybody remember why I had you look up at the ceiling? Light scatters. Everybody look up at the ceiling. Doesn't light scatter? Yep. Do electron beams scatter? No, they shoot straight. They don't scatter. So you get a, a better image with electrons.
Okay, so the stereoscope will be on your test. You have to be able to spot it. You know, it is called a stereoscope, page 16 and page 17. But some people call it a dissecting scope. time you use it to look at external details. It's like a really nice magnifying glass. Oops. Okay, I have two stars on number four. I'm going to ask you many questions from page 18 and 19 in your lab manual. We spent quite a bit of time going over the parts of the compound light microscope and what they do. So study page 18 and 19, parts of the microscope. I'm going to many questions from that. Page 18 and 19. Okay, so I drew a field of view up here for number 5. FOV is short for field of view, which means a circle of white light that you can see. Um, on our scopes, we have four, excuse me, that's a lie. We have three objectives, a 4X, a 10X, and a 40X. Which one gives you the largest field of view? The 4X. Okay, now when you're using the 4X, let's just say you were using it with the letter E. Let's say you found the letter E and it was up here. Okay, look at my little drawing up here. See my letter E? I'm on 4X. Before I go to 10X, what should I do? I have to center it. Because you just said this one has the largest field of view. And so when I go to 10X, the field of view is probably only going to be this much. So will you get to see the letter E? No. So you've got to always center what you look at. When you're on 4X, you can use the coarse adjustment and the fine adjustment to focus. And then you center the letter E and you go to 10. And you can use the coarse adjustment and the fine adjustment to focus. And you center the letter E. But when you get to 40X, you cannot use the coarse adjustment anymore. You can only use the fine adjustment. But okay, I'm remembering that. So I'll ask you that. What adjustments can you use on the different objectives? You can use coarse and fine when you're on 4X. Coarse and fine when you're on 10x, but only the fine adjustment when you get to 40x. Okay, everybody go to page 21. We completed table 2.3 on total magnification. There was really a basic calculation here to do total magnification. What is the basic calculation? Cheyenne, say it louder. Thank you. Ocular times objective was our basic calculation. You needn't memorize any of the numbers because you're going to be having a microscope right in front of you. It'll be right there. And I'll have one or another clicked into position. Let's just say I put the scanning clicked into position and I ask you what the total magnification is. You don't have to memorize the numbers. You just have to find the numbers on the microscope. How do you know which one is a magnification number? It's got an X after it. Any number with an X after it is a magnification. So you find 10X on the ocular, and you find 4X on the objective. So what's the total magnification? 40. So you don't have to memorize the numbers. You just have to know how to find the numbers and know to multiply them. So the objective has an X mm -hmm. and 
the reason I mention that is you guys remember by looking at those scopes, there's all kinds of numbers on those scopes. The, the numbers that have X's are the magnifications. Okay, we already answered this question. Which objective would give the largest field of view? Scanning, Scanning also known as 4X. So we always start with that one. Okay, page 20, the word inversion. Okay, so if you saw this letter E with your eye, that's your eye right there, here. That's your eye. What would this letter E look like under the microscope? Upside down and backwards, that's right. And it'd be way bigger, correct? Be upside down and backwards. That's what we call inversion, inversion. The top becomes the bottom, the left becomes the right. Plus there's the magnification issue. That's the whole reason you're using a microscope is for the magnification. You're not using it to invert things. That's actually a kind of a drag that it inverts things. But okay on that one. Inversion, what it is? Okay. How does inversion relate to microscope usage? Well, if you move the slide to the left, which way does the image go? To the right. If you move the slide down, the image goes up. So microscope usage is opposite. Movement is opposite. And I think we answered these questions on page 20. You may find them in the middle of page 20 under the bar that says observation inversion. Ready okay on exercise two? Okay, I'm moving to exercise three, and to go really fast on this, I want everybody to go to page 40. Go to page 40. See what you find there. You remember, you had a quiz over this. Side note, the quiz is part of lab test one. The quiz you took was part of lab test one, so it'll all be bundled together for one big grade. Um, what chemical is used to test for protein? Say it again. Biurette. What's the positive response for biurette? Purple. And the negative? See it there on page 40? Let's try another one. What chemical do you use to test for starch? Positive color? Yeah, it could be blue, dark blue now. We've got to have dark blue. Black, purple, chocolate brown. Got to be dark colors, dark. And uh, the negative color? Amber, good. What chemical do you guys use to test for sugar? Very good. You got to have heat. Okay, positive colors. Orange is one. What else? Yellow is one. What else? Even green. Green means you got a little bit of sugar. Yellow means a moderate amount. And you get to orange, you got a lot of sugar in there. Those are all positive colors. Negative color? Blue. How do you use brown paper to test for lipid? Well, first you got to evaporate the liquid. So we did it real quick with a microwave. Did you guys know I was alive before there were microwaves? 
Go home and ask your parents about it. It's pretty cool. This is so not on topic. We got our first microwave when I was in the fourth grade, and we got a dishwasher that year, too. Mm -hmm. What was your mom doing? No, I was the dishwasher. That's why it made a big impression in my life, okay? Yeah. Okay, you got a microwave it to evaporate the liquids, and then if there is lipid there, so the positive response is a translucent spot, which means you can see light through the paper, and the negative response, no translucent spot. You may have a spot, but if it's not translucent, then it's not lipid. This is a real quick review of everything. You know, you've learned that before. We've had quizzes over before. You're good on that. Okay. Yeah, so in reality, thanks for that question, Taylor. In reality, the test that you took on, take, I'm sorry, that you will take on Thursday is only worth 90 points. Oh, okay. And the other make up the rest. Okay. That's good. Good question, Taylor. What are the building blocks of carbohydrates? Now, as we get started on that question, I want to give everybody, give everybody a reference page. Page 28 and 29 are excellent pages to reference for this question. I need the basic building block of a carbohydrate. Well, some people call them simple sugars. Thank you. One and the same. A monosaccharide is a simple sugar. A simple sugar is a monosaccharide. They're one and the same. The smallest little units of carbohydrates. Okay, building blocks of lipids. I found those. A great reference page is page 34. Seemed like this was on our test last week, wasn't it? It's good. Again, a nice reference so you have some good artwork to glance at to go with your notes, page 34. Okay, proteins, I believe page 33 is our reference page for this one. Yeah, everybody knows this one. You can use AA for an abbreviation for amino acids through the semester, AA, because we're going to talk about them so much. They'll be in our notes so much. AA is a great abbreviation for amino acids. I remember very well amino acids were on our test last week. So the other one was just glycerol and fatty acids. Mm -hmm. Yep, so lipids are built of, built of glycerol and three fatty acids. Proteins are built of amino acids. And carbohydrates are built of monosaccharides. Okay, so these little units that are built to make bigger units are called monomers. Because mono means... One, and you put monomers together to build a polymer because poly means many. And so it doesn't matter which page you pick to look at, but just so that we're all together, let's all go back to page 28 so that the class stays together. Page 28, and take a look at that chemical reaction where monosaccharides are being combined to make something bigger called a disaccharide. What kind of chemical reaction do you do to make monomers combine to, to produce polymers? Uh, 
And again, it doesn't matter what page you look at. You could be looking at the production of carbohydrates or lipids or protein. You're going to see the same word, dehydration. Okay, you can stay on that same page. What if you wanted to take a polymer and break it down into monomers? What reaction would you do then? Hydrolysis. Okay, number three, define monosaccharide. Well, we just did that. Simple sugar. What's an example of a simple sugar? Glucose. That might be your favorite. I like it too. Some of you know this one. That's an F-R-U. Fructose, yeah. I think I... I drink a lot of fructose, unfortunately. You know, Coke, Dr. Pepper, Sprite, Mr. Pibb, whatever your choice is. It's full of fructose. Okay, if a monosaccharide is a simple sugar, what's a disaccharide? an example of a disaccharide. Maltose. Anything else? May you know another one? It's in a little cup at your house. It's white. Salt. Not salt. Try again. Sugar. Sugar. Sugar, table sugar, as Alexis is mentioning, is sucrose. That's a disaccharide. How about polysaccharide? Many. And Jonathan's right, many simple sugars, they are connected to each other via covalent bonds. They are connected to each other. Um, what's a great example of a polysaccharide? Page 29, starch. That's a good one. Anybody know another one? That's a monosaccharide. Another one. Well, I figured you wouldn't remember this because you're an American. Cellulose. Americans don't care anything about cellulose. Should you care about cellulose? Yes, you should care about cellulose. Cellulose. <laughs> um, cellulite. Cellulose is what we normally call fiber in our everyday life. And if you look at labels on foods, that's what they're calling cellulose, fiber. Cellulose is fiber. And give me two reasons why you should care about fiber. It cleans you out, keeps your digestion going, everything moving through your food tube. That's number one. Number two. It satisfies your appetite. It makes you feel full. So it's good for weight control. Okay, question four. What is the common energy? I use capital E for energy, and I'm going to use that today in our lecture and to, on a Thursday in our lecture. Capital E is going to be energy. It's my abbreviation for energy. What's the common energy storage form of glucose in plants? Starch. That's good, Cheyenne. Starch. It's how plants store their extra energy as starch. They make glucose and then they convert that glucose to starch to store it. What plant structures store starch? 
Well, we called them starch grains the other day. They're also known as, but this won't be on your test, they're called amyloplasts. But they're just basically starch grains. We saw starch grains under the microscope when we made a wet mount of potato the other day. What did we add to the potato to make us see the starch grains? Iodine. Mm -hmm. So I have that question, what must be added to potato to see starch grains? This number five is a harder question. What's the structural form of glucose? It's a polymer, and it's found in plant, plant cells, but it's, it's for structure. It's made out of glucose, and it's a polymer. I'll give you a hint. It starts with a C. Cellular. Thank you. It's for structure. Plants use it for structure. Starch is for energy storage. Cellulose is for structure. Gives plants structure. Starch grains. It's starch grains. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, sometimes the answers are so easy, nobody wants to pick them. But okay, on number five so far. Okay, second part of number five. I need a cell part made of cellulose. Plant cell part made of cellulose. Cell, cell wall. David, was that you? That's Sean. He knows some stuff. I didn't say he was genius. I said he knew some stuff. Okay, Sean had told you his IQ? No. Okay. Okay, number six. What term describes the bond between amino acids and a protein? Yeah, it's a peptide. And guys, I think that's on page 33. If you want a reference page for that, the peptide bond. Uh, lab manual? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, all the page references I'm giving today are for the lab manual. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, number seven. We did a little activity one day, and I drew it out here, where we put water in one test tube and bile in another test tube, and then we added oil to both of them. And let me tell you where you did this at, guys. Um, you did this on page 36, page 36, table 3.8. And the day we did it, I told you then that I would give you two test tubes on the lab test, and you would have to figure out which test tube was oil and water and which test tube was bile and oil. You had to figure out which one's which. So I think you wrote down some observations. Uh, one of these test tubes, when you shake it, the oil makes little droplets. Which one is that? The water one? No, ma'am. It's the bile. <laughs> one of these, when you shake it, the oil simply just goes back to the top. Which one is that? The water. So make sure you read your observations. Page 36, test tubes 1 and 2. Test tubes one and two. Uh, bile is an emulsifier. That means it breaks oil into small droplets. It also makes the oil polar, where it will dissolve in water better. Bile assists with your digestion. Okay, that same day we looked at adipose, and it's on page 37. What's the... What does adipose look like? There's a picture of it, page 37. 
top of the page. What's it look like? Looks like bubbles. And they just look like bubbles? Yeah. And they're, the bubbles are full of fat. Hey, Mr. Gilmore. How you doing? Can I have a animal cell model? Have. Does it have forever? Yeah. Nah. I use mine on my test. Sorry. I need one, too. On your test. Bless your heart. Good luck on that. Okay. Adipose tissue is fat storage tissue. So I'm pretty sure we're going to have to do three functions of adipose. Three functions. So I'm going to get us started. We do fat storage there. Now, real quickly, guys, I want to ask you, this is, I think, from last week's test. How many calories per gram in fat? Nine. How many calories per gram in carb? Four. How many calories per gram in protein? Four. So who's the most efficient in storing calories? At four? Fat. Can you say it again? Sure. Nine calories per gram for lipid, which is fat. Four calories per gram in carbs. Four calories per gram in protein. Who's the most efficient in storing calories? Lipids, because it's got the highest number per gram. Do you guys know calories are a measurement of energy? Calories are a measurement of energy? So... Lipids are the best to store energy. And then what are the other two? I'm sorry, I can't. Lipid, four and four is what? Protein. Carb and protein. Mm -hmm. That's a, a repeat. So fat storage is also energy storage. What's capital E stand for? Energy. Fat storage is long-term energy storage. That's your savings account of energy. It's fat. Some of us have good savings accounts. We could retire. Number two, it's another function of adipose. Page 37. Cushioning. That's right. So it is a, a great protection material because it cushions. So your body will put adipose around fragile organs like the backside of your eyeball. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of cushioning. That's true. Number three, I need a third function. Insulation. Good. So you found these. They are in your book. Last question about adipose. Where can you find it in your body? Under your skin. It's mostly under your skin where most of your adipose is, right underneath your skin. It separates your skin from your muscle. Okay, exercise four is on cell structure. How do you determine if a cell is prokaryotic or eukaryotic? What do you look for? Nucleus. Which one has a nucleus? Eukaryotic. And so on a lecture test, I'm pretty sure I asked you that on a lecture test. Now you're going to have to show how you can do it using a microscope. Okay, so your skill in being able to do it. I need characteristics all cells have in common. I'm going to get you started, and I think we can come up with four things that we've learned. Oops, that's a two. I'm going to get us started. Plasma membrane. All cells have a plasma mem membrane. Go ahead. Ribosomes. Starts with an R. All cells have ribosomes. What else? Very good. All cells have DNA. All cells have RNA.
Doesn't matter if you're pro or you or if you're eukaryotic, you have that.